Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. Hi guys, welcome back to another show. Today's guest is uh, Marik Redick. Uh, Marik um, has previously worked at Ajax uh, in the academy, also at West Brom, and also for the Dutch Football Association, as well as having some first team experience in Belgium. Uh, this is really a fascinating, uh, about an hour, 15 hour, 20 minutes chat. We had to sort of reel myself in here because we could have chatted all day. He's really intelligent, really insightful, obviously, you know, everyone wants to know about Ajax, one of the best academies in world football, statistically in terms of you know producing uh, professional and Champions League players. Um, obviously, a club close to my heart. So I've always followed since I was young. But obviously, a club that has a training philosophy similar to myself, very much revolving around ball mastery and one v one and technical excellence. So I was really fascinated to get into this with Marie and find out what goes behind the goes on behind the scenes at Ajax and his experiences, his journey. Also, really interesting listening to his moving over to West Brom and uh, you know his his. Um, you know, his experiences in English football, English academy football with West Brom, a real top academy in England, and obviously he's moving into first team football as well. So it's really fascinating, really interesting. Uh, I know you're going to enjoy it. Also, all the podcasters, podcasts you can watch live, uh, recorded live on the Inside the Academy YouTube channel. Um, we film it on the webinar software, so if you'd rather watch it back uh, rather than listen to it, check it out on the My Personal Football Coach Inside the Academy YouTube channel where all of the uh, podcasts now are kept as well as obviously on your regular podcast host providers. Uh, proud to announce also some new club partnership members, uh, Leighton Orient and Cheltenham Town FC, two pro clubs in England, join the Arsenal and Wolverhampton Wanderers, uh, Middlesbrough and pro clubs all around the world and over 100 grassroots organisation clubs around the world. We've had in the last week clubs from America, Canada, uh, Dubai and Australia sign up. So really proud that the club partnership's growing. Uh, if you're interested in how the My Personal Football Coach Club Partnership can take your club or federation to the next level, just drop me a line and we can set you up a demo account. Uh, all the players get the app, the coaches get the app and the coaches get the coaches resource as well. And you can log in and check the usage of your players. It's, it's white labeled with your club logo. There's nothing like, uh, like nothing like it out there in the world. And if you want to, you know, whether you're, you know, a pro club or you're, 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 you're a local club, you want to give your players a world-class ball mastery and one v one program. Uh, just drop me a line because uh, my personal football coach is the answer. Uh, but without further ado, let's get into this one. This is a cracker. So, Marink Redake, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. The first question is always the same. Can you give us a little bit of a brief um, outline of your playing and coaching journey up to this point, please? Yeah, I've, I've played myself until I was 17, 18 on a, well, we say national league level more or less. Um, didn't make it professionally and had no chance to do so. Um, I jumped into coaching by accident. Um, and from my town club, I ended up with the National Federation here in Holland, uh, doing like a interprovincial under 13, ultimately. And um, then I had two spells at Ajax Amsterdam, two spells at West Bromwich Albion in Birmingham. And um, I uh, was also assistant first team coach in Belgium at KSV Rooselare. Fantastic. Very nice, sharp, concise. I like it. <laughs> Great. So let's, let's talk about your first coaching job. Tell us about that. How does it happen and um, what was it? Well, the, the first coaching job, there was um, the National Federation. The, um, I, I, as I told, I, I coincidentally went into coaching because uh, my neighbor needed a coach for his team. Um, his son uh, was playing in, so they asked me to give a session. Um, and I really liked it. Um, and, and after a year, more or less, there was a, a guy from the National Federation watching our match. And um, he asked me if I wanted to join the Talenton program. So I was uh, interested in doing so. So it was every Sunday, more or less, you, you train the best talents of the region. And that uh, quickly turned into becoming an assistant coach of the under-13s and ultimately becoming head coach there. Uh, of tell, the us, tell, 
tell us a little bit about that. Sorry to interrupt, Marink. So, because uh, um, previous guests from Holland had talked about that 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 provincial work before. So, you're taking the best players from all different clubs for one day a week. Is that how it works? Are they from academies? Are they? Yeah, so in Holland you have a lot of grassroots clubs and um, it is a, a little bit different than in England, uh, as I understood. Um, so in Holland you have a lot of amateur clubs having their own academy and um, growing them at their own academy into first team, really. Um, and and the, 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 the National Federation separates a few districts um, and those districts together are based on like provinces. And what we did was um, in my first, in the first job I was talking about. So uh, on the Sunday mornings, we took like from the region, so from a district, the best amateur players as a sort of talent pool for pro clubs to maybe um, see it, how certain individuals coped with um, higher opponents or higher uh, level opponents and higher level teammates. Um, so it was more like a talent pool for, for the pro clubs here in the, around the district. So you have to say Ajax, AZ, Alkmaar, Volendam. And um, uh, that, was, that was really the, the base. And then it, uh, if there was the under-11s, and if, if you go further, so the under-13s, you got the best talents of those talent pools of the under-11s. And they jumped into the under-13 under or, or under-12 uh, team. And um, you played matches against those um, those clubs, those pro clubs. So uh, there was on, that was on a Wednesday, I believe, which was um, first two times. It was a training session, so you got to know each other a little bit. And after that, you 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 played against all pro pro clubs or other provinces uh, from the same uh, the same teams, if you know what I mean. So that's interesting. So you're almost like a development center. For the pro clubs in that region, you're developing players to see potentially if they have the ability to go into high level. Yeah, that was uh, the intention of of the of the program, really. And so, how long did players stay in that program for the eleven? So they until they, you know, maybe until they get released, like a, an academy, or they go get promoted. Uh, yeah, it depended. So. Um... If, if they managed to go to a professional club, they were out of the program, obviously. Um, but sometimes it happened that other players... So every every year, at the beginning of the year, there was a selection. Um, so the, the former players were always invited. And some new players from the scouting list were added. You played like a sort of selection days, so two or three. They were they were all... And then you picked the, the team. And from that, you, you built the team up. But I always wanted that there was an opportunity to get like one or two players in for one or two matches in order to maybe see if, if there are some talent, so some late developers or some, some players who were not scouted yet to give them an opportunity as well to get into the program. So you, you selected like 16 and then you could add one or two more. And so, what, what was, how did that relationship work with the clubs? For example, for Ajax, Alkmaar, Al, 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 you mentioned. So, how did you did you say, oh, we have a good, or did you just play them? They see them, they like them, or they keep in contact with you, or how does that work? That relationship as a working with several so that, clubs. Yeah, yeah. So the, that relationship was based. So the the national federation sent out the program of our team, and so the the clubs had the opportunity to scout them, and in that program there was one match. Uh, against that that team, so against Ajax, against Volendam, against uh, AZ Alkmaar, FC Utrecht sometimes, and so they had an opportunity to see them against their own teams, but also they had the opportunity to visit the other the other matches as well. Interesting. And so tell us about your first sessions, then you know, on your first these first sorts of things. What a typical session looked out looked like for those under 11s. Well, that, that was that was based on on more technical details um, combined with a little bit of tactical elements. So um, that was a first touch shooting, uh, beating one v one in offense, but also beating one v one in defense. Um, so if you look into those elements, you got into a little bit more specifically. So let's take a touch. How is your body position before you receive the ball? How is your first touch? Where is the, the direction you get your first touch? What is the weight of your first touch? 
Um, and all those kind of little details you, you, you mentioned to those players. Uh, however, it is always a contextual thing. So um, such a such football is, is not only about, a, there is no great technique, if you know what I mean. It's always seen in context. So for me, um, that was always one, one element which is re really good to take into account. Um, if one player is not executing in the right way, if you know what I mean, but is very effective with it, it is not bad. It makes uh, it, 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 it's an opportunity to maybe, how do you say that, po polish it a little bit more yeah, sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so that's, that, was, that was a little bit of the approach. And the tactical elements you put in then is like, okay, if you defend uh, 2v1, so uh, you, have, you have two opponents against you and you have to defend that. What is the best thing to do? And then you had a goalkeeper behind him. So what is the best thing to do? And how uh, can you give the opponent the least time and space? And you talk about those basic things. So what is your body shape? Where, which, which side are you pressing? Uh, why are you doing that? Uh, what is the position of your goalkeeper? Those kind of little elements. So tell us about then your, a couple of interesting things that you talked about. So, uh, you know, for instance, the technical detail. Mm. I mean, where did you then, where did, did you just have that information yourself as a, from your playing days? Did you take that on board from coaching courses? Did you research? Did you study? How did you bring that to the players? Tell us a little bit about your journey in that process. Uh, yeah, well, in, in, in that way, in, at that moment in time, uh, it was just about a sort of feeling, but I uh, an, an experience, um, and I always was interested in those kind of things. I had a friend who was very big into the technical details, so we spoke a lot about those things. But f further up my my journey, so I was twenty at that time, more or less, and uh, now I'm twenty nine. And um, in this in this uh, journey of nine years, I've yeah, researched a lot. So I, I've done a, a bachelor's uh, and after that I did a, a bachelor's in, in organization science, which I didn't really like, but okay. Um, I got the opportunity then to, to go into a coaching a master's, so a master's in coaching science at Hartbury in England. Um, are, are you familiar with that? Yes, yeah, uh, football college, it's football school, isn't it? Yeah, and and from and from there, I uh, I also did my doctorate in the coaching science at the Cardiff Med University, and and that makes me made me think differently about football as well. Not only about my coaching, also about football, because also with the experience you have at Ajax and West Brom, where you work with former professional football players, you learn very very quickly um, how they explain certain things to. To players, I, I I I can't do it myself, but by just looking at them, I understood the basics and the, the very very details of of certain uh, technical but also tactical elements of the game. So through those nine years, um, through studying, through like a sort of practical masters, if you like, and um, and also a lot of courses and a lot of visits to other clubs, other sports, um, other types of coaches. Um, made me like, yeah, broader orientated. And of course, doing like football licenses, um, B, C, A license. So, uh, and I also did the uh, youth awards, which also add something towards your, towards your coaching. So yeah, uh, exactly. that, that is a little bit of the, the journey. You, talk, and you talked about 1v1, this is a big part of what I do, my work, it's a big part of my mm. philosophy and obviously really big in Holland. So tell us a little bit about that then, how important that was and is in, in coaching young players at for, you know, attacking and defensive wise. So for me, for me, that, that the, the, the 1v1 and especially in the future will, will be one of the things which will be uh, making a difference in the game, yes or no. You already see that now. Um, and I believe that um, a 1v1 specifically um, is has to be learned in the early ages because then you learn I call it always like me and the ball so how, how a player an individual learns to cope with the ball and you have to 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 um, to see uh, what kind of player has what kind of a weapon so a weapon is pace it can be it can be a, a first touch and 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 what kind of technique technical 1v1 skill they they really 
uh, embrace. Is that the right word? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for me, um, that is well, that is the, 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 that is the start. So you have to know your player first, and then you have to unpack certain things uh, in the technical skill they already show in order to to polish and make it better slightly and slowly by a sort of way of go and explore and make mistakes and and do it your way because if i tell them my way that is not their way so they need to explore and i just need to be their mirror in a sort of sort of childish way for for child friendly way if you like and and the med the, the older they get um those those basics in so in the under 16s i trained or on the 19s, I always had that same mirror towards them, like, okay, if you just do this a little bit better, what do you think about that? How does it feel? What are the, what are the consequences of, of this? So maybe that is before you receive the ball, you have to adapt your body position. Or before, if, if the opponent comes to you, maybe you have to delay a little bit in your first touch. Or you have to attract him in, in, through a dribble in order to beat him 1v1. And what is the distance towards your opponent so all those kind of little things you get into very detailed information towards players and that stays i think and i believe through their whole career so the 1v1 in defense and in attack is is one of the things which which is key in in, in football so tell us a bit about then your 1v1 sessions what would that look like at the younger age groups and then at the older age groups as well so, so you can you can do a, several several things. I believe you can do uh, you can do it opposed and unopposed. It depends on what kind of level you work at, and also what is the is it the first session you do or the later session you do. I prefer if you unpack a a technique. I prefer first in order to 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 train it dry, but then as a sort of warm up. So it's not not um, uh, an unopposed session only just a warm-up to, to make them um, feel the, the exercise or so the 1v1 or like a scissors you, you train or you do like a step over or you do like a cry turn. Um, and then from that, um, you, you build it up a little bit more opposed. So that can be like through putting a, a defender in, which is like defending half. So like and not passive, 100%. Passive, yeah, passive pressure. Yeah, passive, yeah. 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 And uh, and then you build it up towards uh, an opposed uh, one where the, the pressure is too much and they fail. Uh, but I believe that is something fundamental in life that you sometimes fail. And then from that failing, you start to learn. It's like that's a great example I heard from my professor at the university, which I never forget, is um, what we tend to do is that we judge a lot during the first uh, during our years as a human being. And we are very negative about things and you can't make mistakes. But the funny thing is, is that one fundamental thing in life you learn is walking. And you do that really every day. It's a, a very fundamental. Uh, you, you don't even take it into account anymore. And the funny thing is how we learn that as human beings is through really uh, standing up, falling down and getting positive feedback. So I never heard a parent say to their child, uh, when they fall down for the first time, hey, you have to stop doing that because you fail. No, it's always like, no, no, come on, stand up again, and we go. Uh, let's let's walk. Yes, your left foot first. Oh, we fall yeah. down again. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Is yeah. that I, way? I, I think I I think I think you make great point there because I mean I think that a lot of people, especially in this country and all around, you, you see in social media, uh, make a common error when talking about this type of work because you mentioned earlier in terms of context and. Because I'm a real big, you know, a lot of work I do is players, ball mastery, dynamic ball mastery. And it's always contextualized to the game, to the 1v1 mainly. And like you talked about giving players that those movements, that ability to get to know the ball, but always linking it to a 1v1 situation of unopposed, but then always, you know, progressing it to the opposed. So people some, sometimes think, well, how can you contextualize something if there's no game or un, uh, opponent around you? But it's about the, the ability of the teacher, the coach to support the player right into making those connections and then leading into an, an, an opposed and then you know scaffolding that learning like you're talking about right i think yeah. that's a big problem we have here people don't understand that and maybe that's why technically a lot of the players aren't at the level as a lot of players are in holland because they have that more ball mastery 1v1s work and here it's much more uh, inclined to just put them in a game or put them in those rondos and that sort of thing so i think that's a, a disconnect people have really with the with the theory and, and the practice there What's your what's your thoughts on that? 
Well, it's an interesting thought. Um, I believe there is there is also uh, in Holland we can improve this, um, and I believe also that it's a, it's a, a cultural difference. Uh, when I went from from Holland to England, um, I had a total different type of player as a coach. So I, I in Ajax I had more not physical players. They were they were okay physically, but not like big and strong and and, and very very quick. Uh, but here, but 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 in Holland it was more about technical details. And in Holland you are a good player when uh, when you have technical abilities and can combine them with tactical elements. And I I found it fascinating to see that in England it was a total different thing. And it, it is not bad or, or or better. It is it is just a total different approach towards the game. Um, and I believe that is the core of the difference between the Netherlands and England. Uh, but I also I also think in in the Netherlands we can be more um, open towards to give players opportunities to explore themselves the, themselves more. So yes, we learn a lot of brilliant basics. So the like the the first touch and the the passing and the shooting, etc. But how many times do we give them opportunity to really develop their own skill uh, within? Uh, and their own decision, so their own execution, if you like, and their own decision making. And I think we can do that a little bit more. We, we can loosen that a little bit more in order to let the players show themselves. I call that creativity. So uh, if a player shows a, a, a sort of himself in, a, in an action, that is, a, for me, that's creativity. So that can be a defensive thing or an attacking thing uh, element. But um, yeah, that, that is for me key. And I believe that we can do that more and better. And you also hear like the discussion of, of people saying that nowadays the, the players are behind the PlayStation and are less on the streets, which is true. But what can we do then in order to in order to change that? And I think also one of the elements is in our coaching and in our freedom we give to the players, because sometimes we as coaches and I was also guilty about that from uh, is that we, we, we tend to say too much to the players sometimes. Yeah, I think it's always a balance. It's always a balance for me. I think we've had you. You obviously did the youth licenses, and you know that's that was really empowering for a lot of coaches. Getting more game-based scenarios and game-based game stuff in training. Um, but for me, I think we went too far that way here now. When people saying you know, anything away from the game is is no good. There's no context. Or actually, you know, I will say if I'm doing a session, maybe twenty percent of my session will be unopposed, and the rest eighty percent game like but still that small part is vital a part you know give players opportunities on the ball build that relationship the freedom and also the guidance but you know it's, it's about balance right and understanding when and where to, where to do that 100 percent. I, I i agree um and it depends again on on like look if i if i am in in in, in uh under 16s under 19s football and you do an unopposed. I also believe you have to put like intensi um, the intensity very high, and that's not only a physical intensity, but also a, a mental and psychological intensity. And, and and by doing that, your technical details are under severe pressure. And then you can um, show them that um, although it is unopposed, you have stresses in your head, and therefore your um, your, your technique is under pressure. And so there is a, a sort of a match realism in that in an unopposed press, uh, practice. So tell us about that then. How do you add those elements of stress on the player and an unopposed, especially in the older ones? So, so for example, I was uh, when I was working at West Brom, I, I worked in close companionship with my SNC coach, physio and um, and, psych and the psychologist are, uh, who were around, and we, we created some exercises which were like very high intensity physically, um, but also very difficult in order to cope with uh, psychologically and mentally. So, for example, an unopposed practice was a practice where there was a, a clear rotation. It was all like very easy. It seemed very easy, but the the, the problem was that if one player made a mistake, the whole exercise was was uh, killed. So in order to to, um, to 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 really execute it properly, they needed to help each other. They needed to look forward and be proactive. If 
uh, there was a at one cone if you had if you just released the ball you had to be very quick to receive the other ball so there was a lot of different things going on besides there were two players standing continuously turn, uh, rolling around in the middle which wasn't the uh, the something you want so that was like a methodological methodological step um which you then say, okay, go on, continue. But there were two players in the middle. Uh, you find out yourself how you solve that problem. I don't want them to be in the middle constantly. So that's up to you. Play on. So they had to solve a problem while they were still having like an overload. And But it became a little bit more easy. So they, they, they found a solution towards the first problem. But then you add a second problem in that, in that uh, um, technical uh, uh, part. And the demands from me were then very clear and very easy. Every ball needed to be perfect in the technical um, in the technical way. So you touch your 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 pass on the right with the right precision, so the right direction and the right pace. Um, what needed to float over the pitch instead of like bubbly. So um, those kind of elements in, in your coaching only you can you can take into like an unopposed practice. If you do it a post. You can you can also add like um, like certain rules, or you referee very bad, or you explain. That's what I did as well. I explained, for example, a, a practice in Dutch towards the English players, so they didn't understand the word. And at the end, I said, "Good luck." Hmm. Um, and they had to find out themselves how they how they solved the problem. And I don't. I I just. Um, explain the Dutch, but but show with my body language a little bit what I wanted. So the the core, and furthermore, I was I was fine with everything. But I was curious how they cope with it. How and that, those with it? those kind of things you can do. Yeah, interesting. Um, we'll come back to West Brom in a little bit. Let's go on to Ajax yeah. then. I mean, tell us about how that came about and your first impressions going into that massive club. Well, I, I was. Uh, I would, yeah, it was well. I was at, I was at the national federation, and a friend of mine who was uh, working at Ajax already was asked to do like um, uh, opponent analysis uh, during the Future Cup. It's like a tournament here in Holland uh, at Ajax, uh, where all kinds of big clubs come every Easter. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to join him and help him out uh, because uh, he needed some extra eyes. Um, so I went with him and. Uh, it was by coincidence that every time we watched the match, um, Ajax played the team I um, made the analysis of. So every time I was explaining what I was seeing, um, how they played, my uh, my thoughts on how Ajax could could use their strength in order to um, to get into their weaknesses. Um, so yeah, uh, that that was the first start. Um, uh, in a way, and I met there uh, Saito Ali, and he is uh, now the academy manager, and I thought that I could learn a lot from him. So, um, ultimately, uh, I, um, I went to Saito and asked him, like, uh, is there anything, like, uh, what, what, what do you recommend? I just finished my uh, bachelor's, and I want to explore if, if football full-time is something for me. So, I said to me, like, what do you really want? I said to him, like, yeah, if, if I can enter, well, if I can look over your shoulder for a year, that would be great. So he said, okay, I'm, I'm going to look if that is possible, but don't expect anything. And uh, a few weeks later, I received a call if I, uh, if I was still interested. So then uh, obviously I said yes. And uh, I, was, I, was, I was coaching then the under 17s, 18s, and 19s in a sort of learning assistant role. And um, it was very interesting because. You had the six weeks uh, cycles, um, so every head coach uh, swapped the um, team. So the under-17 coach, after, after six weeks, went under-18's coach, and under-18's coach, after six weeks, then became under-19's coach. And, every, and, and we, or I, um, and, and the individual coaches, um, we swapped every day. So, um, so, so, so what, was, what was the reasoning behind the changing every six weeks? That was to avoid that players were not getting all attention from from different coaches. So if you have a coach for a season and the coach didn't like you, for example, that was one of the reasons. It shouldn't be that because of that coach, you miss a year of football. Um, or 
that if the connection between the coach and you isn't as good, you are not dependent on the coach only. And besides, you know, the advantage was that um, you always need to cope with new circumstances. So it's your journey instead of the journey of the coach only. So it can't be the coach who is an excuse, more or less. And so what, tell us about your first impressions then when you arrived at Ajax. What were, what were they? Cool. Um, <laughs> It was it was doing like uh, there was a big learning curve for me. I was uh, out of the blue. I stood on on the pitch with a lot of ex professional footballers. Um, there was a there was a really great um, uh, how do you say that uh, like age groups that were really good. Um, so in every day, I learned so much in in terms of uh, the the football content um, things going on in football, how the football world works, those kind of things. And also the, um, the, 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 from that module I just told you about, what the advantages are and what the disadvantages are and how that works and how that affects players and how that affects coaches and what it means. So it was a total way, new way of working, which was also very fascinating to, to experience. So get, let's get into that little bit, some details then, because obviously Ajax, one of the best academies around the world, everyone wants to know what happens there, what mm -hmm. makes it such a strong academy. So tell us a bit about that. And, you know, what is what does a typical session look like? What's the methodology, the philosophy? Tell us about the inner workings there at the academy. Well, you work, they work from a certain certain principles, um, which all have to do with uh, dominating uh, possession and, uh, for example, the 1v1 and... and, and um, developing a, a weapon for an individual is, is key. Uh, the individual there is always uh, first. So what does that mean is that, um, and that's also one of the reasons why they swap coaches or they, they still swap coaches, I believe in, in like the under 15, 16s, but then in half a year, um, is that the individual needs to have all the attention. It's not about the team. It's not about the coach or it's not, it's just about every individual there. And, uh, they they make tailor made uh, programs and and plans with the players in order to let them grow. The sessions are based on team, but also on individual needs. Um, they have a lot of skill trainers over there, so ex professionals, which I found great to see. That they well, a, a coach like me, I can't do the things they can. So having those kind of people walking around in such a academy is, is, is really good in order to show players how things really look like and explain how they feel and what they do and where the foot is. So the very details, but always also with a picture with that, not only on the video, but in real life. Um, I think that's a strength. And one of the strengths is also like the very culture at Ajax is, um, uh, is also a special one. I, I mean, every culture is special, but um, there is a high performance culture uh, from from the youngest youth you, because there is a lot of expectations around those players and uh, not from Ajax itself only, but also from the, the, the outer world. So so the external world, which makes it makes it for players on the uh, young players um, good to experience because that's also where they come to in in a later stage of their career hopefully and um so yeah so you have to 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 cope with certain dynamics and pressures tell us a bit about that you mentioned you know having a session which was based around the individual and the team can you give us an yeah. example of what that looked like so if you do for example a team practice um you have um you have certain aims with the team but within that session you can also take one or two individual needs out in order to, um, to, 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 to improve them as well. So let's, let's take a practical example. You train, um, let's say, uh, playing in the final third. And then what you see at Ajax and in Holland as well, uh, and I think in youth football in general, is that the players come always towards the ball. Now, if you have a player who comes towards the ball and you really need him to go in behind, you put that player into uh, against an opponent who is very strong in defense, very, very strong in the 1v1 defending. And from that, he has you, you have a trigger point for him to, to, to let him lose the ball three or four times. And then you ask him, 
why are you coming towards the ball? What is happening? Or you can ask him a question in order to um, print into his mind that maybe the solution can be in behind in order to create or space for himself in the in the first but with the first run, or maybe if you let it two times and then a, a third time you do like you going in behind and then come towards the ball, then you have more time and space on the ball. So that is that is the the, the thing you'd like to show, and you can do that within a team near, within a team session. And tell us about what what would a typical session look like at those age groups at that time. Uh, it was it was variating. So we had like well, it, it it changed now. So it is I don't know if it's legi legitimate to to tell because now they train. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, but, you know, looking back, I mean, you know, it's still okay. interesting to understand what you saw because obviously training then you know players have come out of that system top quote yeah no so it's it's uh, <laughs> what what was what was the main thing is that um, you had skill training half an hour on i don't I, I, for sure on friday and um, i think it was on tuesday or monday one of the two and um, so skill training is like uh, you separated some some players and they went off with individual coaches and they trained the skills they needed. Um, and furthermore, it was uh, there was a high intensity day on the Tuesday uh, where you had like the four v fours, five v fives, or like the bigger uh, from, from at, at the start of the season the bigger uh, games, and then you you build it down during the during the season towards the smaller sided games. And uh, there was a lot of possession play with different possession plays, which was which was key uh, in in the way of developing the Ajax players. Um, and you started always off with um, with a uh, passing drill, um, and normally it was unopposed, uh, but sometimes it was opposed, or uh, it was based on the position position specific elements. Um, so that it, it varies, but it was more or less warm up. Uh, a, 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 uh, I think ten to fifteen minutes uh, unopposed practice, which could be precision specific, could be just general, just extended warm up. Then you got into a possession play, and then you got into like a game, um, which was uh, maybe, and the game was always like. Um, some some element a problem from the match or from uh, the team uh, development or uh, path in order to in improve that. So it was you build it up from from scratch. So the the the, the warm up was linked with the the unopposed. The unopposed was linked with the technical or tactical. So the possession play and then that linked into the bigger game. So it was was like that. Does it make sense what I'm telling? Absolutely, it's interesting. So I've, okay. I'm lucky enough. I've visited Ajax a few times. I, I, I travel a lot around the world, and very mm -hmm. lucky to visit Ajax quite a few times in the last few years. What I notice is that if you look in the older age groups and the YDP, maybe sessions there look quite similar to what you see in England and around the world. Like you said, run positional, some rondos, positional games, and some small side games, technical work maybe. But what's different, I think, there is what happens in the foundation phase with the younger age groups, where it's much more ball mastery, 1v1, the smaller sided format sort of things. Do you think that's the real difference there, what happens with other you know, other clubs around the world in terms of that? Is that why you get those the, te the technical outcomes? Is that the, the difference of focus in the small, younger age groups? It can be. Um, but I was at, uh, so at Ajax, I didn't work in the foundation phase. And at West Brom, I, I just went there a few times in order to see how that was built up uh, out of my interest, but also to to coach there because I liked it. Um, and, and the thing was that, yeah, there is a, there is a slight difference in, in, in that. Um, but I can't tell what the real difference is because really the focus at West Brom, and that's my only reference point in there in that way was uh, that they all went for technical details. However, how you train them uh, and how you bring them back to, to, uh, to life really, that was slightly different than I was seeing at Ajax. And I also didn't work at the foundation phase at Ajax, but you see sometimes some practices. Uh, and that, and I think it, it is, and again, I come back to the cultural differences on how you see the game. Uh, there is, there is a, a difference in how you, uh, what kind of player you look for. I think it starts already in the recruitment phase where 
if you have like a, a player who is, for example, very gift, technically gifted um, in Holland, that would be a, a diff, that they would give a different um, conclusion there towards the player than uh, in England, I believe, because that was something I, I found fascinating to experience. And uh, it learned me a lot because, uh, that, uh, again, there's no bad thing about um, the way you look at football here because it opened my eyes because I was looking through the Dutch glasses, if you like, but I learned how to look through English glasses to football, which also makes sense to me in, in a certain way. So uh, well, it, there I, is no... I, I think it's yeah. an interesting point, Mary, sorry to interrupt you, because um, we had ADB Vest was on the show Vesh, who was the previously the, worked at Chelsea when I was there, and he was a 23s coach, a fantastic coach. But he instantly he said when they played Ajax in the 23s and the UEFA tournaments, that was the only game where he thought, where he anticipated to have they'd have technically better players than Chelsea. And I thought that was quite a, a, an interesting statement because obviously Chelsea one of the strongest academies in the world. They pride themselves, but like I say, culturally. So my question would be: Is why then is that? Is that to do with the the development program or is it culturally like you say you know the confirmation bias you know more looking at different things and is that you're identifying those technical players and or those sorts of things it's an interesting i you know interesting sort of argument isn't it to try and think why that why are you producing those technical players those technically better players is it the program or is it culturally just a thing you know that holland has i think it's 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 the combination of all the things you mentioned um the, the culture decides how you look at the players, the history of the club decides what do you expect of the players and the coaches as well. Um, the program then is built around that, that format. And I think it's not uh, like exercises are sources in order to reach a certain goal. And I think the exercises or the practices we, we do as coaches are quite similar all the time. But it's about the, the detail of the trainer or the coach or the focus point of the coach which and the trainer, which can make a difference in here. And I believe that that is also a part of, of that difference or the, the, that Ajax has a, or, or a certain way of playing. Uh, and it also has its disadvantages because um, you have, you have a, a typical uh, way of playing which also has disadvantages sometimes. So... Um, I believe that, that there's a whole bunch of little things making a big difference at the end of and, and in the end project, if you like. So the uh, so the under twenty three, for example, like you just mentioned. Well, essentially, because I always tell this story when I was I was took the under nines at Chelsea on a tournament in Holland once, and we were we were at this complex, and there was this, these guys were playing squash in a squash court. You know, squash court. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. With they were playing football in a squash court, and we saw them yeah, at our hotel. I said, wait. What are you doing, guys? The guys are oh, we were not. They were like a lower division team on their pre-season training, and they're mm -hmm. playing this game. And I thought that's you know I'd never see that in England. I don't think you know someone you know working that way would be a much more physical type thing. And I I think that's what's interesting the the, the cultural difference. Even like a yellow league club like that, the emphasis on technique and their training and like you said, you know the physical. You know I'm working at Chelsea. The physical corner was such an important part of their recruitment and they you know built almost everything around that. Whereas I think Holland maybe it's more sort of tilted towards a technical corner, if that makes and, sense. And, and may I ask you a question? Why is why is that that that, that the, the English game is so much around physicality? Then, in, uh, as you well, said, I think culturally, I think if you look traditionally, and I, I, I know, and it's changed over the last 10, 15 years because of the mm -hmm. great work at the FA and what Plaza does. It was England was, has always been a very physical game, very direct, crash bang wallop, if you like tackles and you know fighting and that's part of the english game cultural game and obviously people have you know in the past looked at physical assets first because you know they can dominate games that way you know one of my other colleagues who used to work at spurs said they had a question that one time actually from holland said you know english football is very much about you know you, you see a brick wall you try you know in a game you bang you try and bang you bang you try and bang through it whereas other cultures will try and go around. The English mentality is I'm just going to smash through this brick wall as hard as possible. So it's a cultural thing, whether the physicality and the, the, the intensity brings to it. And it's changed. It has changed quite a bit in terms of we have more technical players coming through in the culture. But still, we have that inclination. Oh, he's a big boy. He can dominate at nine and ten. You know, and that's how we maybe measure success. But well, the performance corner is a lot more important uh, at the younger age groups here, I think, sometimes. Interesting, because it, it links with how I 
experience with England. I, I always found it fascinating to see because I went also to rugby and at Hartbury there was a, a lot of rugby school as well, so the university there. And uh, I, I watched it a lot and I never, because in rugby here in Holland is not a, nearly non-existing. And um, the, the, the thing was that the, the way they play football in England is familiar to how you play rugby. I, I, was, I was, is there a link yeah. there maybe? I was, I was wondering. Uh, no, but, um, and I can see I tell you I can see what you mean. But I mean, yeah, a lot of people who they come on the show from other uh, footballing cultures always say the same thing: English players, big and strong, and quick, and that's the. And I think that's traditionally that's been a really um, you know important part of the English game. And if you look how the English FA have changed with the DNA in the older age groups, specifically, I'm talking about the recruitment process changed, the culture changed, and Gareth Southgate has finally brought us into the modern game and towards how the first team play. You know, mm -hmm. now it's about technical footballers playing through the thirds, playing proper football, you know, the modern football, I like to call it. But we still have a lot of people who, you know, maybe pine off the old ways of sticking in the channels, getting on the second ball and a bit of crash bang wallop, if you like. So still a cultural, cultural difference, I think. No, but I, I also saw like a lot of when I was working at West Brom, you had a lot of teams who tried to play. Um, and, and try to do things no, yeah, in a different I think, way I think than that, expected well, it to be. Yeah, yeah, I think, well, I think, yeah, like I said, it's changed in the last 10 years, the ECCP yeah. and the professionalisation and the, F, the FA leading it. So now more teams are trying to play football on the floor, you know, trying to play through and, and have that more of a modern look on the game. You still have some academies that, you know, play that old way and maybe there's an argument to have that a bit of a mix and contrast. But I think traditionally English football was like that and, you know, was slowly sort of evolving out of those those times. Just before we go on to the to the um, moving out, just tell us a bit more then about your your experience at Ajax. Before we go to West Brom, tell us about your second um, your second job at Ajax. You went back to Ajax, and you was you went there back there as a head coach role. Is that correct? No, uh, well, there was a yeah together with uh, ex professionals. So um, you you work we worked together in companionship, um, and and I did the under 16s there with uh, Norden Wouter and Richard Knopper. Um, and it was it was uh, interesting to to see that in uh, because I came from from England back and and you, you look totally different to the to the same environment if you like so that was a very interesting way and a very interesting approach um, but uh, the second spell at Ajax I, I really enjoyed uh, but there was something I missed in in a way so um, the. And I always take this as example. When I went in Holland to the supermarket, I knew perfectly where I needed to find any, everything. But I, when I went to England, there is a, some vegetable called tauge in Dutch. But I had no clue how to explain that in, in English because I wanted to make my best recipe and that was tauge was included. Um, but I didn't know how to, how to do that and how to say that and how to explain it. So I went to the lady and after 10 minutes, we found out that it was bean sprouts. And... And uh, so, so those little challenges I missed um, in my daily life, but also around. So there was no masters anymore, and I wanted to in develop. Um, so my second year, I really enjoyed football-wise with the players, with the coaches. But I missed that little extra. Um, so that's why I also went back to England. Uh, but that year was was for me also a year where where you where I learned a lot about. Um, how you how you could get like so because that that group was also talented, but had a different characteristic than the groups I had before, also at West Brom, and so how how you how you have to change yourself in a certain way or have to adapt yourself and adapt your tone uh, towards a certain players in order to get the best out of them, and that was that was fascinating to 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 discover. And the cooperation with those ex-professional was 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 great because I think we we how do you say that uh, were, uh, we 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 helped each other in our weaknesses and strengths. How do yeah, you say yeah. that? Uh, Collaboration, collaborated. No, no, it's it's like um, if you if if one side has this, the other side has that, and it it links together very well. I forgot the word now, uh, but doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so let's just go. Just talk about that then. Tell us, like a game day, the 16s. I mean, tell us yeah. what, what, what's what's a form, what's a tr traditional formation and style of play there for the for the for the team. So it was a four three three, and you could pick like if you play with a, a number six or a number ten. So there would be two two pivots or one pivot. Uh, that was um, what you could choose yourself. Um, we we tried always to play out of the back. 
um, we always wanted to dominate, uh, press high, um, and and uh, get some players uh, in certain positions on the pitch on the ball. Um, that was like if you if you look from a very global general uh, perspective, that was what, what we looked for. So you have the individual and the team needs together merged together again, um, and. The best thing is, I believe that um, is that you have like uh, in Holland a lot of a lot of different ways of of how you could how you could try and press because in Holland there you have uh, also a lot of teams who who would like to play out of the back so don't play a long ball and sometimes I think that's also again a negative thing because if you play ultimately against the team which plays only a long ball you have to defend your, uh, your own uh, in a different way but anyway so you could you could you could try and 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 challenge the players in different ways that was one thing and how a game game look like uh, to answer your question you, we got there um, you do a warm-up which was nine of the ten times a warm-up with the the physio then you they could like shoot themselves a little bit warm in, in, in uh, with with the, with two of them to just passing about towards each other then they went into a, a position play and then just the finishing um, session all the defenders with headers and uh, long balls and then we went in and then we started to play the match and how important is was winning on those games well how, how was the balance between winning and development uh, is that uh, uh, for my personal perspective well, from, from uh, when you were at Ajax, what was, the, what was uh, the club philosophy on that? The club philosophy is that it is all about the individual to develop the individual. So the, 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 the performances in the weekend are second. Uh, it's always about the individual and how they develop. So um, our best players often went to the under-17s to play higher up, and we got under-15s with us. And still, uh, there is, a, there is a, a need to win the matches because ultimately it's about winning. But... For the coach, and I agree personally as well with this, the coach should be focusing on the development of players and the players should focus on win the match. And um, that's also something I, I, I take with me from Ajax is that you should, you should, as a coach, always take into account with the match the development of the players. And that would be first and foremost and, and also maybe the last thing you think about because the match... That is for the players, and the players need to win the match because ultimately winning is part of football as well. Uh, but it shouldn't be within your coaching or within your um, uh, how do you get game uh, game approach be the leading figure for a coach in youth development. Um, if you get to older age groups, maybe you 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 do you pick your moments where you do focus on those things. But then again, it would be a developmental point. So give me a, let me give an example. If you are trailing, you, you purposefully try to coach certain individuals in order to, to, get, uh, to get at them in a, in a way you also can expect in the first team football. So that it is, it, I will never say it's life or death, but it's, it's a little bit similar than that. And from there, you try to explore uh, how they react on that and maybe have a, a reflection point after that match uh, based on how they react on it. Um, and, and so then winning becomes part of the development. Uh, you got Absolutely. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, we, uh, you, Usterveld was here on the show recently. He's from PSV. He works with younger age groups. He was talking about the challenge, basically, of you play Ajax. They're the big, that's the big game of the season several times. You want to win that one. It's important for the club. But the challenge is almost a lot of the time because your Ajax had the same problem as at Chelsea. We were, were so much more dominant than a lot of the academies. The games maybe weren't a ch weren't a ch enough of a challenge for the players, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had that? How how do you ensure you know you're the biggest club in Holland in terms of you know your history and you've you've got the best players? Was it sometimes a challenge getting enough of, of from the opposition? And how would you challenge your players within that environment? And also, then, how important are those games against the bigger clubs, your PSVs, your finals, and that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I believe that, that one of the things is then you, you coach in a different way. So uh, I had the match where we were we were winning a lot, and my coaching became more direct than questioning and 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 demanding more than more than um, exploring. 
Um, so if we were four nil up and there were 30 minutes to go, for me, it was about the technical execution, the execution of your decision making needs to be spot on on the right moment with the right pace. Um, so my coaching became more more dominant in a certain way in order to put that pressure on um, or my decisions to maybe substitute a player uh, because he wasn't performing uh, properly uh, because it was too too relaxed if you like um, just to give a signal to the other players that okay if, if you don't if you don't perform accordingly then you go up uh, because now we are our own opponent instead of the real opponent. And if, if we were trailing, for example, if we were losing a match, it was for me, I, I took a different tone of voice or so my coaching became different towards the players in order to to get, again, because they already have that, that, um, that intensity from the opposition. So my coaching should be only about uh, maybe asking a certain question or re-emphasis that they're doing well or um, that they should try something. Um, and, and it depends on context, but if, if we had like such a, such a, a, an easy game, there is no easy game, but if, if it was too, too easy sometimes, then you, you, you try to, to be, the, be the intensity yourself. So you, you, you get up the intensity by demanding more. Interesting. And what, how important were those games against PSV and final, the other big clubs in Holland? No, of course they are important. I mean, um, the, you, then you play against uh, the other top clubs. And for me, that is like, no, I, I wouldn't say a reference point because a match is also like a moment. It's not like decided that if you win today with, uh, you, you lose tomorrow, you, that, that can happen. But you can see where certain players are in their development path. So for me, it was like, okay, how does this individual do with, within those circumstances with the pressures coming through, uh, how does he uh, hold himself or doesn't hold himself together? And why is that? So let's, let's now move on to West Brom then. Tell us about that. Yeah. How did that, you, you know, you've, you've gone from the, the nice scenic canals of uh, Amsterdam <laughs> and then you've gone to the, the sunny West country, the black country as they call it, sorry. Yeah. No, so how did that happen? How did that happen? Well, I, the, in my first year I went to England, I. Uh, I went to do the masters and uh, I got the opportunity to work at West Brom um, through, yeah, uh, I don't even remember how that was, but, but, but through, I came in, in touch with Mark Harrison and, and he, uh, he gave me the opportunity to work at West Brom. Um, and it was, yeah, again, uh, like I told you, a very different environment, which I very much enjoyed, uh, uh, learned a lot from um, in, in all aspects. So what kind of players you have, but also what kind of personalities. So uh, an example, again, if I was explaining something in Holland, at the end of the, um, at the end of my explanation, there was nine of the 10 times a question like, uh, sorry, coach, why are we doing this? Or what makes us doing that? And when I explained in England, everybody said, okay, well, let's go on. And we, we get on with it. And there were no questions. And I was like, oh, What's, what's happening here? You should ask me some questions, guys. Come on, uh, I need to be challenged as well. So that was those kind of little elements, all kinds of different things. Um, the approach towards the game, how you approach the training sessions. They had the E Triple P rules and and those um, PMA um, stuff. It was it was yeah. For me, it was a total new world, which let me learn a lot about. How you how you can also develop players in a in a way because if you only are used to Ajax, um, that is also a, one way of developing players. If you know what I mean. Give us some give us some um, details then in terms of that approach in the game and sessions. What was the main differences? The contrast to working in Holland. Um, at Ajax, you had like uh, the, the, the approach of the game was 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 similar they wanted to play a similar style of football at West Brom um, and they recruited also and they had some very interesting players over there uh, which could play that way um, but again um, how how they how they develop over the years was different so from from foundation phase to early YDP was different than happened in Holland so the emphasis was on 
had been on different elements than, than at Ajax, where it's just me and the ball. And he was also about a lot of tactical things. So you could, you, I had to adapt myself a little bit towards that uh, way of, yeah, that way of playing and that way of coaching. So in order to get... tell, us, tell, tell us about that then. What's the difference? Yeah, it's, what's it's their, difficult what's to explain. To um, I think I think I was asking you asked me the question. I was thinking, what is now real? If I look back, what is really the the difference? And to to be fair, I I struggle with giving a, a specific element. Maybe it's the way coaches coached was different than in Holland. The way so when I entered like uh, the 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 Premier League. Uh, how do you say that? No, it's not the Premier League. It's the um, I, you sign the contract, you get like a, a book telling what you can't and, and can do yeah. with health and safety. Those kind of little things are, are making you as a coach act differently. Uh, and I believe that there should be health and safety for sure. Uh, but sometimes it can also be too much because sometimes a, a player needs some an arm around him. But if you look strictly to the rules, that isn't that is not possible. If you know what I mean, you should do that with a certain distance, and that is something. Uh, it's a delicate discussion, uh, but th those little things uh, make it different. And I believe also that the different background of the players, where at West Brom there were some players which were uh, coming from health, uh, or wealthy backgrounds or very poor backgrounds. So and and in Holland that that big gap was also I I believe smaller I think they were also from 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 poorer backgrounds but not as 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 I experienced in England um, the 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 rough uh, the roughness there was was sometimes harder than than in Amsterdam but to be fair I think that's also a good thing for for certain certain players in order to survive in the football world. And so, and um, you mentioned before about the players. Maybe they didn't question stuff. What was the other major difference between the players in a 16s team in West Brom and the players in the 16 teams in Ajax? So the, the the technical details of the Ajax players was averagely averagely seen. It was better. The tactical understanding of the game was average. If you look from an average base, better. However, the mentality of the players and the physicality of the players. I believe in England was better. So if you have the two together, you have a, I think a, a great, yeah, have a great mix. But um, I believe that within West Brom, you had a, a lot of players which have as uh, had good potential of playing playing uh, professional football. Especially with, if you look to the English game, uh, and in Holland that was the same. Because if if you look in Holland and you compare to, uh, so I watched a lot of Championship football and a lot of League One football and a lot of Premier League football. And if you look now to the second league in Holland and the first division in Holland, um, we have, yeah, there is a total different way of playing. The intensity is different. The, the, the style of play is different. So I could see, because I, I, I am ingrained myself a little bit, I try to ingrain because I'm still Dutch, but I try to, to get myself into the English football and understand the English football. I could see the potential of players they had maybe with less tactical and technical understanding, but maybe they by adding that towards their game, they had the potential to play professionally. And uh, at Ajax, you have the same because in Holland, it's not so much about physicality; it's more about tactical and technical details. And you don't need to run up and down the pitch constantly because you have a lot of transitional moments. You have them, but not as 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 they have in in English football. So it's not the I wouldn't say kick and rush because that is that is not really what you see in Championship and especially not in in Premier League anymore so much. But uh, that is that is uh, the the main difference. So in my opinion, uh, you have a lot of talents in, in on both sides for the specific way of playing in the country. Is that an answer your question, by the way? You, yeah, yeah, it is. It's interesting. Do <laughs> okay, think, sorry. Do you think? Do you think the main differences are then? In the English game, are the physicality and and the the, the increased amount of transitions just generally in the game? Well, that, um, uh, yes. So if you if you look at um, the high the high intensity of the Premier League and the Championship, 
you, you and, and the way, for example, of defending. So I'm now following a team in, in, in the in the championship and they play man mark. Yeah, in Holland, you never play a man mark. So that means that you have to have different types, different way of playing in order to to um, execute the game model accordingly. Um, so that means that you have uh, you have certain players uh, there and not in Holland and vice versa. Uh, what, what, what were the other major differences just within academy football in general, you know, game days, relationship with other clubs and those sorts mm -hmm. of things you experienced in that those years at West Brom compared to Ajax? Especially the traveling distances. That was one thing. Right. <laughs> uh, no, but then, but um, I think the, 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 uh, the 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 accommodations so like the training grounds and the way the, the 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 pitches you play on in general in England are much better than in Holland. Um, if you look at the facilities, more or less around the players, so around as a staff, so the SNC coach, physio, all this, and they have full time members or for that that is better than in Holland because in Holland you have ISP, Feyenoord, maybe AZ Alkmaar. And then I believe there is not much, there are not much academies who have like um, so many staff around in order to develop players. I think that is a positive thing as well. So there was a, there was also a, a difference. And if you play matches, you played against different, um, uh, different ways of playing often. And that's also something I, I found fascinating. So you played with uh, against the five at the back. Uh, you played against a team who played four four two with long balls or always. Um, uh, you, you played against teams who didn't want to play but just just want to park the bus and and wait for that one or two chances. And for me, that was as a coach was interesting because in Holland is mainly four three three with uh, with an attacking midfielder or a defensive midfielder, and then you have to have this several specific um, players who come free in certain spaces so it is it is i wouldn't say it's predictable but it gets a little bit predictable and with this it was fresh for me so that was a difference and at game days especially in the in the cup because in holland you have um the under yeah the under eights play also like competition so they have a league table and and in england until the under 16s you don't um, and the only thing was the Flitler Cup or the FA Youth Cup. And uh, that was interesting to see because my first uh, match there, we played against Arsenal. It was like 3-3, um, uh, extra time. We went up 4-3. And, and, and the whole team, including staff, were next to the, to the sideline because there were two minutes to play. We were in front that we could beat Arsenal then. And, um, and everybody was very enthusiastic. And that's something which... Don't, never happened in in Holland before. So I was watching. I was like, "Holy, what's ha what's happening here?" I was looking around, like, "What's what's what's happening here?" Um, what, then I do now, what, uh, what did you say? Everyone was what? That what? Every, everybody was so enthusiastic and were was so into the game and wanted to win and was All was right, okay. like it, oh, it was nearly okay. celebrating already. So <laughs> for me, that was like, "Oh, what's happening here?" So it was funny okay. to see. And then you see the the difference as well in playing a league normally so that it gets like um, not normal that you win matches, especially not in a, in a knockout phase, but you're more used to winning. But if you take the winning away and then you only have a cup saying that you can win matches and really has a progression by having a win, then the, the pressure on those matches is higher than having uh, the both. So a league and, and a cup game. Mm, interesting. Okay, then let's move on then to to the yep. working the first team. Tell us about that and how that came about. Well, I was I was uh, my that was my second year at uh, West Brom. I had my I did my PhD and my PhD was the first year very uh, practical based. So you we went into uh, every Thursday we had like uh, meetings with um, all kinds of coaches. You had assignments. You had your um, uh, professional development and all that and you, you you brought the theory into practice and the practice you brought back to theory through those discussions and, and in your assignments anyway but that year was done and then you got in i got into my research phase which i 
didn't really like to be fair that was my worst enemy since the start i feared it a little bit because i wouldn't consider myself as a research tiger um so for me it was important um that um i could i could well uh, or develop myself again or stick my neck in in something and i received a call from someone i knew at ajax who was interested in having me in um in a uh, in a first team so i was i was not really keen to leave West Brom because I wanted to stay um, and wanted to do the research phase because I was already looking uh, up against it. But um, I spoke with the manager three times and uh, yeah, I, this was enough. He was from Barcelona. We had the same. He was working at the Barcelona Youth Academy, had experience as a head coach and wanted me to have him with, uh, with his uh, team. Yeah, and I was enthusiastic. Maybe there was I was 26, 26 or twenty seven, twenty seven, I think twenty seven. I was, and um, and that was an opportunity which I well, that was a dream for me to go into professional football. I thought all oh, the the circumstances were good, so I thought, yeah, uh, I have my research phase now. I can extend that. So if it is too too hard, I can leave that aside because there is no need to focus on it now. I don't need to go to Cardiff uh, every week. So uh, I, there is an opportunity to do so. So ultimately, I decided to go. Um, and yeah, you step into a total different world. So give us those then just briefly then. I mean, what were the major differences, the challenges for working at the first team level? It is the paradox between developing a team and individuals combined to winning in the weekend, which is a need. There is no discussion about that. So you should win. Um, there are a lot of different stakeholders uh, who always have a certain influence on the team, uh, external and internal. Um, there is a. There are always like. The, the, the decisions you make are more decisive in certain ways. So it's not like easy to, to get like, so you play an opponent, you, you, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the strength and weaknesses, you know, your own players, but which player on which position. So nine of the 10 times on Wednesday, we were discussing for hours if player A or player B must play as a, for example, a striker, because that was the only, only position. We weren't sure of because the opponent is this. We did that. Uh, let's see how it works tomorrow. And then after that, on, thir on, on Thursday, we were still like, mm, maybe, maybe we should try the other one. So it's every decision you make has consequences for the game in the weekend. And the game in the weekend is decisive if 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 how how the environment and and the players um, see and and believe the work you are doing. So that that makes. It makes it more tense, uh, and it's. I found it fascinating. I found it very nice, um, and especially the things you you look because the football stays the same. But again, the decisions you make for the football and in the sessions and the things you say are are different. And from a personal perspective, it was also interesting for me to to see how players who were professional for 10, 15 years and were close to retirement um got like along with a coach which was well six seven years younger than them never played professionally and uh yeah how how should i behave myself in that environment and i how could i have a relationship with those kind of players and when i drove from england literally i drove from england to belgium that was the thing i thought about always 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 in order to to not be like the uh, it, it it wouldn't be a problem normally, but you have to take that into account because players uh, test you and you should be prepared for the test. Tell us about that then. Then you know those. What was it like motivating those those season pros and having young players in there, just delivering sessions? What are the main you know challenges in that involved in that? Yeah, for me for me there was a. In the beginning, I, I, I tried not to be like judgmental. I just observed. I just observed what kind of player he is, or what kind of needs he has. Um, but also, I wanted to know his aims. Because if you are 36, for example, uh, or 18, you have different aims. 
So I needed to understand what thrives them to be on the pitch every day. Um, and if you understand that, you can also adapt your coaching. So if he just want to be like, if he just want to be the second goalkeeper, for example, and he's fine with that, um, you have to find the balance with him between, okay, uh, you, you are the second goalkeeper. However, maybe we should push you a little bit in order to get like the team performances higher. So for, for the team, for the sake of the team, it's better to do this. But I, how can I help you in order to do that? So you, you discuss more. And with the younger players, you could demand more because you what they well I don't like to to use that, but they they are need to earn the stripes is not the right word, but you know what I mean with that. Yeah. It's um, they, they are more open for those kind of things. They have a, they are totally different in the in the development uh, path. Okay, so now I don't want to keep too long, so we're running over a bit of time there. So just just tell oh. us a bit about your your PhD. Um, yeah. tell us about that. Your, your research, your findings, and how that's, you know, impacted your coaching? So, um, when I was at the first team environment, I couldn't do the two. Uh, again, I just, I just made reflective logs for myself, and, and, and there was a sort of data for myself. So, um, I decided that um, if I want to do a PhD combined with first team football, and I wanted to finish my PhD, then I needed to, the, the thing needed to be about myself. And the second thing is a very selfish thought, but um, it's not that I make something and it is, is put somewhere on a table in a big stack of, of other papers. No, uh, then it makes no use for anyone anymore. So if, if I make something, I put so much time in it, it should be around something which is also useful for me. So I th decided that I would be like a sort of example. So I searched for different theories, different ways of approaching that and methods. And ultimately, I came along with uh, phenomenology. And phenomenology is um, how you see things you normally take for granted, if I say it in a very simplistic way. Um, and it searches for that. So if, if we coach, we do things automatically and we take things for granted. So if I, for example, there was an, in, in my PhD, there is an example. If I look at something, probably it will be based around where I look for. So if I look for a run of a winger, which has to drop 10 meters in the fence, that means that I am only uh, often, my focus is on that specific element. Um, whereas other circumstances around him can be a condition in order that he makes that 10 meters back. But if my focus, and this is a very simplistic example, but it explains this, the, the, the principle. But if my focus is too much on, on him, I may be missed to see other things. So by seeing one thing, I can't observe any other things. So in my observation, I only see him run 10 meters back. But if I am aware of that and can do a step back, I maybe can see more things in the same observation. And you can literally do a step back or revisit what you have seen. So for the next time you're going to observe, you see more. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, interesting. interesting. And, and that's also with your interpretation. So uh, if you interpret things and also the, the, the see, what you have seen and uh, what you have interpreted comes back in your communication. Because how I looked at it is that coaching is nothing more then if you look to the very, very basics of it, it's nothing more than you observe, you interpret, and then you communicate. And I went into those bits deeper. And what I try to do as well, and that was one of the things which was key for me, because otherwise I wouldn't do it, uh, do the research, is that it would be have a practical, applica uh, practical applicable approach. So if practitioners would read it, that, I, that they could understand the the work and it was a nice read because i went through at articles which i found fascinatingly boring it was nearly nearly a a a, 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 a very um competitive thing that you you fall asleep after two sentences if you know what i mean that you read you read two sentences and you think like what the hell is here what what what, what is it what what does it even mean those words Whereas I have an academical background and I can understand that others uh, who doesn't have that, that is even more boring. So 
it is a it, it was something I, I found fascinating because we talk about coaching, which is something practical, and we, we, we theorize it until it's very boring. But it's, coaching isn't boring, in my opinion. It should be fun. And that was also why I chose a path of writing it down and writing it up in a way that the abstract theory and the, the, the level uh, of the PhD is still according to the academic, academic level, but it can be practically understood. And that was uh, something I, uh, I, I I really emphasized on because otherwise it wouldn't make any sense to me. Interesting. Um, and what about yourself? What, what's, what's your future ambitions now in the game? What do you, you you're looking to go back into academy football, back into first team football, back to to, to England? What, what's what, what's your your ambitions for the future? Oh, well, my ambition is like um, so. I took purposefully a, uh, took a year off in order to finish this PhD because the combination of the two, um, after a few months, uh, the head coach and I were sacked as a, from the club, which happens in football. Um, then I took three months off in order to, well, reinstall myself a little bit because I was tired. I was there was so much pressure on my shoulders, and I made needed to make a decision, or I finished the PhD, or I quit the PhD and start into football again. Um, but it's not in my nature to finish something um, without really finishing it. So to quit something in between. So I decided, okay, I take a year off. Oh, <laughs> no, I take a year off. Uh, I take a year of football, and then uh, after that season, I, I aim to finish the PhD, which was a challenge, though, uh, writing up uh, something in a year. But I managed to do that. Um, and I, in between, I did some projects with uh, individual players and analysis of, for opponents, uh, for, for professional clubs. And um, uh, I helped also as a caretaking assistant, if you like, uh, also in a professional club here in Holland. Um, so I did some projects in between, but the main focus was PhD. Um, that is done now. Uh, I finished write, the writing up in, in, um, in August and... Uh, a few weeks ago, I had my Viva, so and I defended it well, so it was all done and dusted. So now, in these Corona times, I'm looking to go back into football. And now, I come to your question. Um, I'm sorry for the long introduce, introduction, <laughs> uh, but um, I, then I look to go into to all like PDP phase head coach as a uh, yeah uh, there um, or as assistant coach in professional football again, uh, because for me that is I think um, where my current um, qualities and characteristics fits the best uh, and and wherever that may be because I'm open to go everywhere um, I like the challenge as I told you I like to be um, outside of, of the comfort zone and don't know anything so yeah let's see where where, where it brings me Maring thanks very much it's been fantastic appreciate your time thank you very much